got lucky today. We have a visitor, an economist from Southern California, Mary Lopez, teaches at Occidental College. She's been working, she's a labor economist, so she's been working in a number of areas around the Latino population, Mexican population, immigration, that kind of thing. The paper she's going to present today is Border Enforcement and Immigrant Selection, Evidence from the United States Southern Border. Mary did her PhD at Notre Dame. And I guess I'll let you field questions and that kind of thing and jump in. And then generally, I would ask people to hold, you know, to ask questions of clarification okay. and hold their big questions and comments to the end, okay. unless you'd rather just take them as you go. That's fine. Yeah. Whatever you normally do is fine. Okay. okay. Try and hold yourselves back a little bit as we go. You can ask something about why did you do that, and if you have a really big challenge, like, why wasn't this about Canada, because you know, <laughs> then we can get to that. <laughs> you say that my paper. There you go. Excellent. It's all yours. Thank you. Well, thank you guys for coming to the seminar, and I'm interested to say a little bit about my work. Um, this is a joint work um, with Fernando Lozano, um, who's at Pomona College, which is about 25 minutes away from my college in Los Angeles. Um, and we started this work a couple of years ago and the paper's been going through you know, different revisions, um, hopefully to strengthen it and, and particularly the, the empirical part of the theoretical um, framework. So I'm interested in seeing what you guys think about, about this work. But basically it came about, you know, we were looking at the literature on immigration and we noticed that um, there wasn't really sort of a gender analysis um, um, in the immigrant uh, literature and economics. And so we thought this was really interesting because we know that um, uh, not only do we see large increases in immigrant, the immigrant population, but that more women are migrating uh, as a result. You know, before the 1980s, uh, most of the migrants from Mexico were predominantly men. That's no longer the case. We see a large presence of women uh, among uh, immigrants from Mexico. So we thought, well, you know, given the large presence of women, given that you know demographics are changing in Mexico, um, fewer women are getting married, uh, fewer women um, um, are having children, um, we started to think, you know, maybe these women, um, as the demographics are changing, are going to migrate as a result of economic incentives. So this idea that typically uh, female migrants accompany their uh, uh, spouses um, is going to be a little bit different now as we see larger numbers of um, economic movers or, or women responding to economic incentives. So that was even further motivation for why we wanted to incorporate some type of gender analysis into uh, the immigration um, literature. And also we were um, uh, interested in seeing, you know, we've seen a lot of legislation uh, in, the, in the 1990s, the late 1990s on uh, securing the border. You probably saw a lot of uh, news articles on the company to, to strengthen the Mexico border, a lot of money and efforts trying to um, secure the border, and we kind of saw, you know, instances where you know, maybe that was going to do some good in terms of, you know, keeping immigrants out, but, you know, when we think about what happened with those policies, it just created um, a sort of diversion effect, and we saw uh, more immigrants having to cross through these sort of non-traditional crossing channels, um, and as a result of it, it was just more difficult for them to cross. Um, they faced greater dangers. And we saw women in particular having to confront a lot of dangers crossing the border. So that was, again, uh, sort of further motivation for the work that, uh, that we're doing here. So as many of you might know, uh, we've seen an increase uh, in the number of unauthorized immigrants uh, in the, uh, from Mexico. About half of the uh, uh, Mexican uh, immigrants migrating to the U.S are um, undocumented, um, and we've also seen different policy responses to the, this increase in undocumented uh, immigration. We've seen policies such as uh, the Immigration and, uh, uh, Reform and Control Act of 1996, and then there was a group of policies that followed uh, in the 1990s, including Operation Hold the Line in Texas, Operation Gatekeeper in California, and Operation Safeguard um, in Arizona. And the goal of these policies were just to create, um, to, to, to keep in, uh, undocumented immigrants out. So the uh, budget for the uh, um, border uh, uh, enforcement increased from 400 million to 1.94 billion from 1992 to 2007. 
Um, they also adopted new technologies, so using things as um, uh, night vision cameras and ground sensors to be able to uh, um, catch undocumented immigrants who were trying to cross the border. And again, we've seen even more recent evidence of trying to, again, put more resources at the border um, to prevent uh, the inflows, the large inflows of undocumented immigrants. Um, the research basically shows after um, these border enforcement policies that it's not really clear that they actually were as effective as we might have believed them to be. That what happened usually was there was this um, uh, diversion uh, created in the sense that uh, immigrants were now having to cross through more dangerous areas like the Arizona deserts. Um, and that, in turn, uh, was making it uh, more difficult for them to cross and raising the cost of, of, of migration. Also, um, they also just as a response to this, instead of uh, uh, not migrating to the U.S., just lengthened the amount of time they were in the U.S. So rather than making multiple trips, these types of policies didn't so much keep immigrants out as much as they just prevented them from making these multiple trips. So the duration in the U.S. Uh, also increased as a result of this. So the research shows that despite all of this money that went to trying to secure the border, despite all the manpower that went to securing the border, it's not clear that it was actually effective. Um, there's more evidence to suggest that it basically just increased duration and it actually also um, just made it more um, uh, difficult for, or, or made it more dangerous um, for immigrants um, to cross the border. <coughs> So as a consequence of this uh, type of policy, um, we saw that if we look at the uh, Mexican migration um, data, and Mexican migration project data is just a, a, an actual survey of immigrants from Mexico and document, actually tells you their legal status and whether they're undocumented or not. But if you take a look at that data, it shows you that um, the coyote prices um, have increased. Um, it also shows you that more women are using uh, coyotes as a response to um, the dangers of actually crossing um, the border. So women are more likely than men to use uh, coyotes and as well as um, to um, um, pay a higher price for the use of these guides um, uh, across the border. And we also know that um, there's been increased reports of violence along the border, um, more gunfights, hijackings, particularly uh, rapes though. Um, so uh, many of these women um, even the ones that are using these guides to help them cross uh, over to the, uh, the U.S. Um, have been, um, there have been reports of significant amounts of rapes and, and assault uh, on these women. Uh, according to the U.N., up to 70% of women crossing the border without families or any other family members um, are abused. Um, it's been documented that women are even um, advised to take birth control um, before they cross the border. Uh, in the event that they actually uh, are raped. Um, between 1998 and 2005, uh, the number of migrant border crossing deaths doubled. Um, and we also see from a report by the uh, Mexico's Foreign uh, um, Affairs Ministry um, that more than half of the deaths that, uh, uh, at the border in 2009 uh, were among uh, women. Do you have any idea what the breakdown of crossers was? I mean, are 50% of the crossers women or 30% of the crossers women? Um, yeah, there's definitely more of men crossing um, than women. Uh, I don't have the exact data on me right now, um, but it's, it's still predominantly men that are crossing um, compared to women, but you still see larger numbers of, of women now than before. But I don't have the exact numbers. Yeah. Uh, who is it who's preying on the uh, migrants? Uh, so it could be even the, the guides themselves, um, as well as uh, sometimes it's the border patrol agents also, or even other migrants um, that are also crossing. Um, so it's, it's coming from different sources. Um, so I think it's just that you know, these women are vulnerable, some of them, um, even with the guides and they've paid, they may think they trust the guides, and then halfway through, typically the coyotes turn on them, um, or sometimes sell them off. So they're paying um, these coyotes, and then in turn the coyotes are selling these women also to other people. So. Um, so it's kind of coming from different different sources, but it's even border patrol agents as well. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so this is just a couple of uh, articles here. Um, this is talking about, um, it's actually in Spanish, but 
It's talking about the report from uh, Mexico's foreign uh, ministry about uh, women that um, uh, actually uh, are dying crossing the border. It's talking about you know, more than half of them being, of, the, of those that have died um, being women. Um, that even though they're coming for economic reasons, they're coming because they're hoping to find greater employment opportunities, they're hoping to find uh, greater wages. Um, it's, it's a huge cost that they're having to pay in terms of, of crossing the border. Um, also, we've seen reports in, in the U.S. news. Um, this particular uh, news report is talking about, again, the high price that, that women pay uh, for admission into the U.S. Uh, in terms of the number of rapes that have occurred. Um, there's also a lot of unreported rapes as well. So this is you know, a, a tragic experience for women, and some of them don't even want to talk about it. So we may have document, uh, a document to an increase in rapes along the border, but that's still an underestimate of probably how many women are actually raped. And, and um, some of the um, rapists basically hanging the undergarments of, it's a small little picture, you can't really see it, but hanging the undergarments of these women that they've raped um, almost as trophies um, to say that they were able to, you know, um, conquer these women and, 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 and abuse them. So what's the goal of our paper? Well, we basically hypothesize that more stringent border enforcement disproportionately raises uh, costs to undocumented uh, women uh, relative to men. So we're seeing all this violence at the border, the increase of uh, probability of getting raped, um, the fact that if women tour to migrate, they're not going to be able to go home and make return trips to take care of their kids or other family members. So we're sort of hypothesizing that they face a greater cost of crossing the border illegally than men actually do. Um, and we also examine the extent to which this greater migration cost, um, because of these uh, 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 different border enforcement policies, has changed the composition of Mexican immigrant uh, women relative to men. So if our theory is um, somewhat correct in that you know, women do face a greater cost, uh, cost of crossing the border than men, but we would expect to see then there should be some difference in terms of the composition of, of Mexican immigrants. So in terms of who's actually coming to the U.S. and who's here, do we see any differences between these women versus um, men? So what we try to do in the paper basically is develop a theoretical framework um, that's really going to allow us to test uh, whether migration called, uh, um, costs fall predominantly uh, on women, um, and, and that's going to reduce the number of women that are actually migrating. So they're facing now this higher cost of crossing the border. Is that going to reduce the number of women who say, look, I'm going to cross now, or they're going to say, no, it's too dangerous, and I'm not going to cross at this time. So we should expect to see a decline in the number of women crossing the border. And so what we're going to do is sort of look for that trend and see how that trend plays out among different groups based on education, as well as based on age. So we'll look at different age categories and education categories and see, do we see the number of uh, um, uh, women who are migrating relative to men um, fall larger in certain age or education categories versus others. And then we're also going to take a look at changes in earnings um, across different cohorts of immigrant, Mexican immigrants, uh, among these different groups by age uh, and education. So if the cost uh, was in fact rising more for women than for men, um, do we see that again, in terms of who's coming, are the more highly able uh, uh, immigrant women, and as a result of a change in the composition as well as a change uh, in observable differences as well, do we see that these women are actually earning more in the U.S.? Because if they're earning more in the U.S. relative to men and relative to older immigrants, then we might think that that's some sort of evidence to support that they might face a higher cost of migration uh, relative to men. So we build on different strands of literature here um, in our theoretical framework. Um, we start by building on the work um, from George Borjas, um, who basically um, gave us sort of this negative selection theory, this negative uh, uh, um, uh, uh, um, uh, immigrant selection. And what it basically is saying is that immigrants with low levels of schooling um, are going to be drawn from countries where a low skill labor is abundant and there's a lot of income inequality. So if a country has an abundance of low skill labor and a large amount of income inequality, then you're going to see that it's the low skilled immigrants or the less educated immigrants that are going to have the most to gain from migrating. 
And that's opposed to highly skilled or highly educated migrants who are going to see that they're better off staying in the source country. Um, Clark also finds evidence of a negative selection for women. So she actually looks at women migrants and finds that also um, uh, migrants that come from countries where there's a high amount of income inequality um, and a large abundance of um, low-skilled labor, that they're going to be worse off in the U.S. That these are immigrants that are less educated, less skilled coming to the U.S., so their U.S. labor market outcomes are not going to be um, uh, as great as they would if they were high-skilled immigrants coming to the U.S. Now, um, the Borjas um, uh, uh, literature, as well as uh, Cobb Clark, they're making this assumption that migration costs are constant. So this idea of negative selection really depends on uh, migration costs being the same across groups, across low-skilled workers versus high-skilled workers. Um, Hansen, Chikar and Hansen actually have a paper um, where they argue, well, what if migration costs do vary across um, schooling levels? So what if you actually have uh, more educated uh, migrants who face lower costs because they maybe have greater access to credit, they don't face uh, quite as many barriers as uh, less educated uh, migrants do. So if you're highly educated, it could be that your costs to migration are actually lower. So by making this assumption that costs could change across different groups or immigrant groups based on skill level, based on education, then it's not clear that you're always going to get negative selection. So according to Borjas, the idea is that, okay, look, high income inequality, an abundance of low skilled labor, the only people that are going to gain from migrating are less skilled workers. Whereas Hansen saying, well, no, that's only assuming costs are constant. If costs are different, then you could have somebody who is highly educated um, basically say, look, for me, the cost of migration is slow, so even though the benefit uh, may be less, the cost is low enough to induce them to migrate. So we kind of incorporate both strands of the literature here in terms of negative selection, as well as this idea that costs can actually vary across groups. But we also look at the literature that is looked specifically at uh, female migrants. So the literature that has documented um, return trips um, being more difficult for women to make. So as border enforcement increases, um, the actual duration of uh, uh, time in the U.S. has also increased. So as it's more difficult to cross the border and more dangerous, you're not going to be wanting to make multiple trips across the border. You're going to go to the U.S. and you're going to stay there probably for a longer period of time than you would if it was safer to cross the border, then you would make multiple trips. So this is really going to affect women more in the sense that, you know, women are the caretakers, uh, main caretakers of their children, um, of their parents. So women need to get back. To, uh, uh, or typically need to get back to care for their kids or parents, it's going to be much more difficult for them to do that um, because the costs are now higher. So we look at that literature as well as the literature that has uh, documented that there are more women leaving their kids at home. So as I mentioned before, the changing demographics in Mexico, fewer women getting married, having kids, but those also that are having kids um, are now leaving to go find uh, more uh, better employment opportunities in the U.S. So in Mexico, we've also seen an increase in the rise of female-headed households. And it's these female-headed households that are actually the economic migrants. They're not tied to the spouse. Um, they're actually moving based on economic incentives. So we look at that literature as well, as well as the uh, literature on, um, again, instances of uh, rape along the U.S. border. So what we do is we're saying, okay, look, we know Hansen is saying costs can change by um, across uh, groups based on uh, schooling. We're going to now incorporate that idea with a gender analysis and say, look, costs can now change also by gender. So again, because women now have um, are more vulnerable to the physical dangers of crossing the border, there's the psychic cost involved with being away from family and unable to return to the source country on a temporary basis. So let's say their kids get sick or their parents become ill. It's a psychic cost. They can't go back because, again, it was so difficult for them to get here in the first place. So these are sort of the two main factors why we think that the cost might vary by gender. The physical dangers as well as the psychic cost involved without being able to go back home. 
So what we're going to see here is that a potential immigrant from Mexico um, in a particular uh, um, age category, um, education category, and gender category, so if we think of a J here, or a G here as gender, uh, J here um, as our age category, and I here as our schooling category, what we're going to assume is that somebody's going to migrate only if the expected benefits are greater than uh, the cost. So what we're assuming here also is that costs, as well as the expected benefits of the wages in the U.S. versus the wages in Mexico, um, are basically a function of somebody's natural ability. Okay? So we're saying within a particular age, educator, schooling, uh, um, gender group, costs are going to be the same within that group, where they're going to vary is across gender. So if you're looking at all women that, let's say, have more than 16 years of schooling, that are older than 37 years old, um, they're going to face the same cost as what we're going to assume here, but that cost is going to be different than it would be if you're looking at men who are older than 37 years old who are in the same uh, education category here. Okay. So they're only going to migrate if the actual benefits, which is represented by the wage differential here uh, between the U.S. wage and the Mexican wage, exceeds the actual cost here. Okay. We can look at this um, in a graphical way as well. Um, the top panel here is just showing you um, the benefits and the cost of migration. Um, so we're assuming that as A increases, and you can think of A as, again, representing somebody's <coughs> um, ability uh, um, uh, level. Um, as their ability increases, and again, think about comparing immigrants in the same age of uh, schooling categories. Um, as the ability increases, we should see that their expected benefits um, would increase as well. So they would expect to earn higher wages as a result of that higher ability. Um, and then we can see here also that as their ability increases, the cost curve is downward sloping, suggesting that the cost of migration should fall. Okay, so again, this is still assuming that costs are different by gender, but that this is just looking at ability. So if we look at the intersection um, between the two, that's going to tell us, in a sense, who's going to migrate. Um, in the bottom uh, panel, we're looking at the distribution here of immigrants. So think about these are immigrants uh, in Mexico of different uh, uh, ability levels. Who's going to migrate? And, and so the, the length of the spell, T sub cap N, is considered to be exogenous, or is that a choice? Um, In other words, how long they stay. Oh, um... And the co cost to go back is this identical for each? Yeah. So the, the, the T, T, zero, T, N is just the length of time that they're going to stay. I mean, technically, again, we're kind of, we don't really incorporate it into the model, but, but you're right. I mean, it could change based on the cost as well, um, affecting the duration. Um, we're going to assume that, um, actually, I don't know if we make an assumption. Well, you, you don't have it in there, so it's got to be the same for all yeah. ability types. And yeah, anyway. I think we're making it, yeah, assuming. Okay. But, but it's not necessarily that that's always the case. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. thanks. Um, okay, so here's the distribution um, at the bottom there. And so we're going to say that um, where, again, the cost curve intersects the benefit curve there for migration, that only those with um, ability levels uh, um, uh, greater, I'm sorry, those with uh, uh, less than uh, A star are going to stay uh, in Mexico, and those um, uh, with uh, ability levels equal to or greater than A star are going to be the ones that actually choose to migrate. Well, let's say now... Mm -hmm. uh, this ability level is different from education, right? Yeah, we're making that assumption that it's actually different, that um, uh, the schooling level is different from, from ability level. Yeah. Um, so as costs increase, we're going to see the uh, cost curve shift out, and then that's going to ultimately affect who migrates. So now with the new intersection at A double star, what we're going to see is that only those with ability levels higher than A double star, A higher than A uh, double star, are going to be the ones that migrate. So there's fewer people that are migrating now, and of those that are migrating, we're assuming that they have to have an ability level now greater than a uh, double star, which is um, more than what we saw before. So that difference at the bottom there between um, a star and a double star um, basically represents the number of immigrants who would have migrated under the old cost uh, regime, uh, but that no longer choose to migrate as a result of this higher cost there. 
Now, if we were to try to test this, it's really difficult to do. We're not really able to directly estimate the effect that uh, border enforcement has on the selection of undocumented uh, migrant workers. We would basically need to observe, if we really wanted to directly measure this, we'd have to observe all the potential uh, immigrants in Mexico. Uh, we'd have to assign them to different border patrol scenarios. Okay? So we take everyone who's potentially going to migrate, assign them to different border patrol uh, scenarios randomly, and then we would need to evaluate whether um, the natural ability of these immigrant women um, uh, actually changed across these different border patrol scenarios. Um, and that's not, uh, we're not able to do that directly given the uh, uh, data that's currently um, available. So rather than do that, we said, okay, well, we can still try to see if we can say something about whether this composition of immigrants has changed a result, as a result of these uh, increases in costs. So we're basically going to use um, equation one to predict how different immigrant groups would behave uh, with an increase in costs. And there's several inferences we can make um, from equation one. So we know as the costs increase, we would expect fewer people migrating. Okay? And if the cost increased again more for women than it does for men, we would see fewer women migrating than we would relative to men. Okay? So overall, we should see the number of immigrants actually falling. Um, we actually should also see something among uh, immigrants of certain age and education categories. So we should see that the decrease, or even a slowdown, in migration should be greater for older workers than for younger workers. So if we go back to our equation one here, again, if C increases, fewer people are going to migrate. That's our sort of first inference. Um, if the uh, uh, gains to migration, okay, if we assume that that expected gain here, the wage in the U.S. minus the wage in Mexico, if that's different for different individuals based on how long they're in the U.S., then we would expect to see that younger immigrants, right, who have a longer time period that they're in the U.S. potentially, um, would actually experience greater gains to migration than older immigrants who actually come in and are, have a shorter time frame. So if we think of T0 to Tn being, again, shorter for uh, immigrants who are older, then the expected uh, benefit to migration is smaller for that group. So again, while we'll see maybe a decrease in migration, uh, we should see that it's going to be greater for older workers than younger workers. So here are this group of older workers basically saying, or migrants saying, look, the cost, I wasn't going to come to begin with, and now the cost is even higher, that's even more a reason why those that might have migrated might now not migrate, right? They have a smaller expected um, uh, benefit um, uh, period of time. We also should um, um, supposedly see a decrease in migration, um, but that it should be greater for highly educated workers um, than for less educated um, workers. So the relative earnings of highly uh, educated workers in Mexico are greater than the relative earnings of what these same workers would earn if they were to migrate to the U.S. So equation one that we just saw um, basically suggests that the expected gains uh, in earnings from migration are going to be greater for less educated immigrants than they are for highly educated immigrants. Or you can think about human capital. Human capital doesn't necessarily transfer easily from one country to the next. So if you think about it, uh, immigrants with high levels of schooling and they can't transfer that human capital to the U.S. so they can earn a higher return on that human capital, then what you would see is they have a lower expected benefit than less skilled workers. Um, I don't understand why ability works differently than education, because you're assuming in your graph that you have uh, that ability is more highly rewarded in the U.S. than in Mexico. Um, the higher your ability is, um, but uh, you seems like you were saying it works the opposite of education. Yeah, that's kind of what we're saying. That um, within so the graph is kind of showing within a specific schooling group. Right, ability should have a positive increase on your earnings and a negative or effect on your um, on the cost. But it here a, 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 a positive is a differential between your earnings in Mexico and the U.S. So you're right. saying yeah. you're rewarded for ability much better in the U.S. than you are in Mexico. 
Yeah, so this is one of the areas of the paper where we also had sort of, you know, um, trying to reconcile that. Because our theory is kind of coming from, you know, there's these highly or, uh, skilled or educated workers um, and that they have less of an incentive to come to the U.S. But you're right, it, it somewhat conflicts with this idea of ability. I mean, we're making the assumption that, that they're different. I think what we need to work on a little bit better is sort of the, sort of the reason why that, and the evidence for why they might be or a theory for why they might be actually different. Um, but that's sort of one part of the paper that we're kind of, kind of working on. But we're making the assumption that, that they are, because without that, it's, it's kind of hard to, 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 yeah. I think that makes a lot of sense, though. I mean, human capital is really nation-specific and language-specific, whereas ability is not. Yeah, I mean, if, if, if the assumption, and there's only been a couple of papers that have shown that um, uh, human capital is not completely transferable, um, if we make that assumption, that human capital is not transferable, then, then there's a reason why highly skilled or highly educated immigrants wouldn't receive that. Um, but it's not still clear, um, the papers were done on uh, immigrants from Israel, so it's not clear in, empirically whether that happens. I mean, theoretically, we might expect that, you know, I mean, a master's degree or, you know, a college degree or even a high school degree in Mexico might not get the same return. Um, in the U.S., but but that's this. So this is sort of pending or sort of hinges on that assumption um, of human capital. Uh, does that answer your question? Okay. So also we should expect to see um, that the decrease for highly educated or older female workers again is uh, greater than it is for men. Okay. So if it is true that women actually have higher costs of migration relative to men, we should see that the decline uh, is greater for, uh, for women than for men across these age and education uh, categories. Okay. Uh, in terms of data, to look and to uh, um, actually uh, analyze um, the differences uh, in the composition, or composition of immigrants as a result of these border uh, um, uh, changes, uh, we actually use the 5% integrated public uh, micro uh, data series, or ICOMS, for the years 1990 and 2000. And then we also use the American uh, Community Survey um, for the years 2006 uh, and 2008. Um, we actually restrict our sample to individuals um, between the ages of 16 through 64 um, who were born uh, in Mexico. Um, also, immigrants who migrated within five years of the survey year. And the reason we restrict um, the sample to uh, more recent immigrants is that, again, we're trying to, our question is really dealing with undocumented immigrants. The census data does not ask any question about the legal status of immigrants, so we don't know for sure Okay, whether somebody is an undocumented immigrant or um, um, in the U.S. Uh, um, um, as a permanent immigrant. So we can't really detect the difference. What we're trying to do is sort of focus on some characteristics um, that would lead us to believe that perhaps we're looking at a large undocumented population. So restricting the sample to more recent immigrants. More recent immigrants uh, tend to be, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, illegal immigrants tend to, or undocumented immigrants tend to be more recent immigrants. Um, so that's our reason for doing that. Um, there's also, as I mentioned before, the Mexican Migration Project data. Now that data set actually gives you information about the legal status of immigrants. So they ask you um, 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 whether you uh, crossed into the U.S. Uh, as an undocumented immigrant or whether you overstayed your visa. Um, so there we know legal status. The problem with that particular data set um, is that we're looking at differences between men and women, and that particular data set has a very small sample of women uh, um, in it, as well as that particular data set um, actually surveys more experienced migrants. So if we want to look at how migrants are responding to these shocks, then looking at experienced migrants might not necessarily give us uh, uh, and a better understanding of that, of how they're responding, because they know the different uh, uh, guides used to cross uh, uh, into the U.S. Uh, they might not actually respond to the shocks in the same way that somebody who, let's say, is migrating for the first time might do. So while the Mexican Migration Project um, um, data um, does give us legal status, the trade-off is that we wouldn't have very many women in it, and we'd probably get an oversample of more experienced migrants. 
Um, there's been some research, again, done by Gordon Hansen, um, that has shown that, I mean, there's not really one single reliable data set to use on undocumented um, immigrants. And that the census data, um, we're seeing a larger number uh, of, of possible undocumented immigrants represented in that data set because the estimates that um, uh, researchers are using to estimate the undocumented immigrant population, they're finding that there's too many immigrants uh, um, in the U.S. Census for them all to be legal. That the numbers just aren't matching up to these estimates of undocumented immigrants, so that there must be a presence of undocumented immigrants in the census. So just sort of a note that as we're going on, the question is, uh, again, uh, on undocumented immigrants, but there may be some uh, legal immigrants that are actually in our uh, uh, sample here. Um, we also focus on single immigrant women uh, and all immigrant men. Um, so again, as uh, demographics have changed in Mexico, um, and as we see, um, again, fewer women uh, getting married and, and having kids, more women uh, now migrating as economic uh, migrants, um, we're focusing on single women so as to emphasize those economic migrants as opposed to tide movers, those uh, um, uh, female migrants coming to accompany um, their spouse. And we also look at uh, immigrants who migrated to the U.S. Um, at age 16 years or older. Okay. Um, so the reason for restricting the sample in this way um, is that we're trying to basically look at <coughs> immigrants who've acquired um, uh, most of their schooling uh, um, in the source country. Um, we also compare throughout the uh, analysis um, U.S. immigrants to um, uh, immigrants uh, from uh, Mexico, um, as well as other Latin American immigrants. Um, when we look at immigrants from Mexico, we're using uh, Mexican um, sur uh, household survey data. Okay, so that's the other data set that we're using. Okay. So figure one here shows um, the proportion of female immigrants across time uh, for Mexican immigrants and for other immigrants um, from Latin America. Um, the proportion of women, you can see here, migrating is declining slightly over time um, for uh, both groups. And again, as we mentioned before, if the costs of migration are increasing, uh, and if uh, these weigh more heavily uh, on immigrant women, then we'd expect to see or expect to observe uh, that the proportion of women uh, migrating is declining. And also, if Mexico is being affected by the increase in border uh, um, uh, <coughs> more than other Latin American immigrants uh, are affected, then we'd expect to see the decline greater for immigrants from uh, Mexico as opposed to immigrants from uh, other Latin American countries. And it's not clear that we see this here. We don't see a di huge difference between uh, immigrants um, uh, from Mexico. In fact, it looks more constant for immigrants from Mexico, and the decline is, is more pronounced for immigrants from Latin America. So this is just sort of looking at immigrants, again, all together. But what if we were to break down this population by age and education category? Um, would we be able to see some differences then? So that, you know, maybe, again, we see differences in migration based on younger workers versus older workers, or um, skilled versus, or um, uh, workers with low levels of schooling versus workers with uh, high levels of schooling. So, the next figure here, um, we actually um, look at um, uh, the female uh, 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 by age category, so the proportion of uh, women by age category, again, for Mexico in, uh, in Mexican immigrants in the U.S., as well as other Latin American uh, immigrants in the U.S. And again, we're comparing Latin American immigrants to Mexican immigrants because we would expect these policies to affect Mexican immigrants more than immigrants from other Latin American countries or the Caribbean. Um, so if we look at this, we see a little bit some, uh, some differences here across age uh, um, categories. Um, so in the first uh, uh, figure, or the first graph in uh, um, figure two, we see that the decline uh, in the female proportions is actually greatest for those that are aged uh, 38 and higher. So we see again some evidence here that among older immigrants, the decline is greatest. And that was one of the things we were um, um, sort of theorizing before, or hypothesizing that if costs increase, then we would expect older immigrants to be affected by this more in the sense that they already have a shorter time span in terms of the benefits that they would receive from migrating, and so higher costs would only make this group even less likely to come. 
So there's some evidence of this in the first figure there, um, compared to those uh, younger immigrants, aged 17 to 27, um, we don't see a huge change over time. Now, if we compare this again to immigrants from Latin America, again, we see a similar trend where older immigrants, uh, um, there's fewer older immigrants uh, coming to the U.S., um, and that that change is, is greater than what we see um, among Latin American immigrants, among younger uh, immigrants. But the decline is more pronounced um, for you, uh, our Mexican immigrants in the U.S., than it is for uh, Latin American uh, immigrants uh, in the U.S. here. Now let's see what happens when we compare um, education categories. So we're just looking at two categories here, um, those that have less than uh, eight years or nine years of education, and those that are college um, graduates. And, um, if we think about this, <coughs> equation one suggested that, again, the migration, assuming, again, human capital can't transfer, um, the migration of highly educated uh, immigrants would decrease by uh, more than for uh, less educated uh, immigrants, holding everything else um, constant. So while the proportion of women uh, has decreased over time among Mexican immigrants uh, with less than nine years of schooling, you can see that it's actually gone up just slightly um, for those uh, college graduates, or it's remained almost un unchanged there for, for college graduates uh, among Mexican immigrants in the U.S. Uh, among Mexican or Mexican uh, residents, I'm sorry, these are Mexican residents, not immigrants from Latin America. Um, but among Mexican residents, we see it about the same for um, those with zero to eight years of education. Um, and actually, we actually see an increase in the number of women um, that have received uh, college degrees. So we can think about this and say, well, what we had hoped to see in fig the first figure there, um, again, as we said that um, if human capital can't transfer as costs increase, we should expect to see um, not only all uh, fewer uh, uh, women migrating, but fewer um, uh, 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 highly educated women migrating relative to men compared to those with lower levels of schooling. And you can see there in the first figure that it's unchanged. Well, another way to think about this might be that among Mexican immigrants, or Mexicans uh, in Mexico, what we see here is that the number of educated women has increased. So there might be some evidence to suggest that as that's increased, they've not migrated to the U.S. So we're seeing no change in uh, um, the um, uh, pattern for highly educated uh, uh, Mexicans in the U.S. If, as uh, the second uh, figure shows, the increase, there's been an increase in schooling among women in the U.S., you probably see it reflected over there in the first figure. And so we don't see it really reflected in the first figure that might still provide some support for our hypothesis that these highly educated women are not migrating. Okay, so costs have gone up, schooling in Mexico has increased, why don't we see more of these educated women migrating as schooling has increased? Um, why hasn't it increased in what we see in the first figure? Well, that might be also because the costs have increased and they're increasing more for that particular group, the more skilled workers. Oh, uh, maybe one other reason is that uh, maybe more of the educated women are actually migrating uh, legally. Yeah. Um, so that uh, they're not as affected by these increasing costs of, of uh, illegal migration. Oh, that's true. Yeah, that's true. I just realized that you were stuck over here because I did not stick with the clicker. Oh, okay. So if you want to use that. I was curious about the Mexican versus Latin American data for females. Do you do you know if there are specific Latin American countries or that that you're seeing that there's a higher proportion of, of females that or, or why why is that? Why is it that generally if you look at Latin America versus just Mexico that you see this higher level of older women and higher level of women in general? Oh, so going let's say like back here, right? Yeah, and the one and the one beforehand too. Okay. So going back here, where we've got Latin American immigrants, so why is it that we're seeing just even a, a trend, the same trends, or what's your Yeah, point? between the, so is there a particular Latin American set of That's countries? driving it, maybe? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you know? Um, we haven't really looked at, um, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, we didn't really break down the Latin American immigrants into more detailed groups to kind of see if there are a particular group within there sort of driving the results. 
Um, but you're right, maybe there is some group in there that's sort of driving the trends, or maybe there's a group in there, right, we're comparing and we're assuming that technically they're the same, right, the Mexican immigrants and the Latin American immigrants, only they wouldn't be affected. So we're assuming they're kind of same in terms of characteristics, but we're assuming that they're, what, they're, what they're differing in is terms of the cost that they face. But maybe there's a specific group within the Latin American population um, that's really sort of driving the results. And maybe that group, we could argue, maybe is not, doesn't face as, as many, many different costs. Um, yeah, yeah. so that's a good point. We haven't looked at that, so that might be something that we, we want to do uh, in the future. Yeah. OK, so in terms of our empirical strategy, we basically um, use a difference in difference, uh, difference in differences, and also a triple difference. Difference in differences and differences approach um, to control for these push and pull factors. So in other words, we're basically saying that, look, okay, costs could be driving this, but there could also be push and pull factors going on in Mexico and the U.S. that are also driving this migration. So what if it was that the strong economy that was uh, occurring at the time that we're looking at in the U.S. was pulling migrants um, from uh, Mexico? Or what if it was the greater income inequality as a result of, let's say, trade liberalization in Mexico that was pushing immigrants out? So there could be other factors that are driving the trends we're observing, not just the cost. So we try to take these into account and control for these differences in the push and pull factors by using this type of approach, this difference and difference and difference and difference and differences approach. Um, we control for the factors in Mex the Mexican economy by just comparing the outcomes of Mexican immigrant women uh, with the outcomes of Mexican immigrant men. Um, and we control for the factors in the U.S. economy by comparing um, the outcomes for Mexican immigrant uh, women with other Latin American immigrant women. Um, so by controlling either uh, groups, uh, by controlling Mexican, uh, the country of origin and only looking at differences across men and women, or by also controlling for gender but then looking for, uh, across differences uh, in country of origin, we can hopefully control for um, these differences here. Our assumption here is that, this is sort of a big assumption that we're also kind of working on to make sure that our um, explanation for this assumption is strong enough, um, but our assumption is that the changes in the Mexican labor market affect the decision to migrate the same for all Mexicans, regardless of gender, um, and that the changes in the U.S. labor market influence the decision the same uh, for all migrants here. Yeah. I want to go back to that that length of time that you do migrate. Isn't there the additional assumption that those the time that they stay in the U.S. is going to be identical and there's no differences in the preferences between males and females? Um, so the length of spell is the same. I'm just saying it's possible that it could be that if the costs go up for one, that means one group may in fact decide on a longer length of spell rather than go and not go. So I'm talking about the... Um, Extent, uh, intensive margin rather than the extensive margin on the migration. Right, right. Um, yeah, I hadn't really thought about, I mean, yeah, that, I mean, that could be a possible, I think I need to think about that one a little bit more, but you know, you're right. Um, it could, it could mean that, again, the durations are, are different between, you know, between the two. Yeah, I need to think about that one a little bit more. Sorry. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, okay, so to test for um, whether the flows of Ill older immigrant women uh, relative to men have decreased during the period of this greater border enforcement, uh, we basically estimate um, the following equations. So um, A is basically a dummy variable that takes the value of one if the immigrant belongs to one of the three age categories that we're looking at. So 18 to 27, um, 28 to 37, or greater than 38 years old. So we're looking at these three education categories here. Um, F and M are dummy variables um, for female uh, and male, and they're interacted um, with dummy variables for year um, for country of origin, either Mex from Mexico or from uh, other Latin American countries. Um, and then we also have our year um, dummy variables as well. Um, the omitted category that we're looking at here, so we're comparing uh, everyone to, is uh, male immigrants from Mexico in 1990. So the, uh, what we're interested in is this uh, triple uh, uh, estimator, this difference in differences and difference estimator um, that's basically telling us about the outcomes of immigrants across uh, uh, gender as well as across uh, 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 origin groups. So across whether um, from Mexicans compared to immigrants from other Latin American uh, countries. 
for our first table here, what we, uh, again, looking at that by just uh, age category here, um, again, we're only looking at our sample, if you recall, includes immigrants who migrated within uh, five years um, of the survey uh, year. Um, the difference in difference estimates are basically showing that uh, gender differences uh, in the change across time and the probability that an immigrant belongs to each uh, age category. And again, we're interested in the triple difference. That's telling us, again, not only about differences across gender, but also differences across these two groups we're looking at, Mexican immigrants compared to immigrants from other Latin Americans. And again, we're doing that because we're assuming that these border um, uh, uh, policies would affect Mexican immigrants more than Latin Ameri other uh, Latin American uh, immigrants. So if we look at sort of the last columns there, the 37 plus years, um, our hypothesis was that, again, women relative to men, uh, would, uh, we would see a decrease if the costs were higher for women relative to men, but we'd also see a bigger decrease for older immigrants uh, relative to younger immigrants, and that we would see that uh, uh, increase bigger for immigrants from Mexico versus other Latin American uh, immigrants. So if we look at that column there, we can see that, again, um, in terms of those that are, that are migrating to the U.S., um, that uh, for in Mexico, or, or column number five, uh, relative to men, we've seen uh, fewer women from this age category migrating relative to men. We also see the same trend among other Latin American immigrants, um, but the decline is greater for Mexican immigrants than it is for other Latin American immigrants. Um, but our result there in that um, uh, column uh, five and six there, um, the triple difference uh, estimator um, is only marginally statistically significant. Um, the other two age categories, 15 to 27 and 28 to 37, um, the um, uh, uh, um, triple estimate is um, statistically insignificant there. So this is some evidence, not a whole lot, but some evidence to suggest that, again, that observation that maybe, it, again, we're seeing a larger decline among these older immigrants might actually still um, be occurring. We also, again, do something similar for um, uh, an education category. So in this case, what we do is sort of take the W variable E, which is representing, um, uh, takes the value of one if you belong to each of the age categories that we're looking at here. Um, we're actually looking across four age, uh, age uh, uh, categories, um, zero to eight years, uh, nine to 12 years, 12 to 15 years, uh, and more than 16 uh, years of schooling. And again, we're also interested in the difference in differences in the differences estimator, which is going to, again, tell us about these differences uh, um, across um, gender as well as across uh, country uh, of origin. And the results that we find Again, if we think about what we hypothesized, uh, we were basically saying that, okay, these uh, um, uh, more skilled or these more educated, I should say, uh, immigrants, that there's going to be, again, a decrease in immigrants overall because the costs have increased. They're going to be higher for women than they are for men. And also what we're going to see um, is that they should, um, we should see fewer uh, um, uh, immigrants with higher levels of schooling uh, migrate um, as a result here. So you can see, again, among those with 16 or plus years, if you think about women relative to men, column seven there um, is saying that there's uh, um, more women um, that are highly educated migrating relative to men, both in Mexico um, as well as um, in other Latin American countries. Um, but our difference in difference estimator there is not statistically um, significant. In fact, um, if we only look, if we look at zero to eight years, um, we see that that's significant. Um, there is not so much evidence here to suggest that among the highest skill level or highest education level, 16 plus years, we actually see um, a lot of evidence to support um, our results here. Um, we basically are saying that if the costs were to increase more for women than for men, and if the costs were um, uh, um, to increase and affect different age groups differently, then we might see differences in their uh, uh, wage outcomes in the U.S. So if we look at wages and control for other things that would affect wages, do we see that wages are higher um, for certain groups? So do we see that wages are higher for women? Um, do we see that uh, um, wages are higher um, for those older immigrants? Do we see that wages are higher um, 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 also for more skilled uh, immigrants? And are they higher for immigrants from Mexico relative to those from uh, Latin America? Okay. Um, so we know that, again, 
um, to see these wage differences, there's other, been other things that have been going on. Um, we would expect to see these wages happening, but there's also been some trends, um, secular trends going on in the economy. So um, the gender wage gap observed in the U.S. Uh, um, uh, has actually declined over time, whereas in Mexico it's actually um, increased. So our assumption here is that the secular change in the decline of the gender wage gaps in the U.S. is similar across demographically equivalent uh, Mexican and Latin American uh, immigrants. And that, again, is sort of subject to you know, debate whether this is actually the same across these um, groups. Our strategy, though, um, is that we're actually going to um, uh, compare again these outcomes between those who, those earlier migrants, those who arrived before 1984, and more recent migrants, so those that came after 2000. So we're also looking across time to see what's happened uh, uh, in terms of these outcomes or wages. So in our model here, Y represents the law of hourly wages of individual I uh, in your T. Um, X is a set of observable characteristics uh, that controls for education, age, age squared, state of residence, year. Um, we also interact year with gender, uh, years in the U.S. and occupation. Um, and then C basically represents our dummy variable for cohort arrival. So we have um, six different cohorts um, that we're looking at. And again, we're interested in that uh, uh, triple difference uh, or the difference in differences estimator. So um, we basically repeat this um, for equation for all of our different subgroups, again, based on age uh, and based on um, school age. And so in table three here, again, our sample's limited uh, to uh, immigrants, but we're no longer actually uh, restricting them here um, to just those that are, have come within five years of um, the survey year. Um, if you look at columns one and two, they represent uh, um, when the results when no control variables are included. Uh, columns three, four, and five, uh, and six represent uh, results when control variables and occupation fixed effects are added uh, to the estimating equation. Um, the difference in differences estimator shows the change, again, in log wages across gender cohorts. Um, and the triple difference estimator, estimator is showing the change um, in long wages um, across gender as well as across country of origin uh, cohorts. So if we look at the table there, we can see that if we even just compare um, uh, column uh, five and six there, when we include, include demographic variables um, as well as fixed effect uh, variables for um, occupation, um, we can see that um, women do make more than men. Uh, in Mexico and Latin America, um, and also that if we compare the two, Mexico uh, and Latin America, um, that women actually make more um, uh, than uh, um, those in Latin, compared to immigrants from Latin America. Um, and that's statistically um, significant there. So again, we see the sort of difference there across these two uh, countries of origin, Mexico and other Latin American immigrants, and we see the effect bigger for immigrants from Mexico. So again, this is kind of supporting the idea that um, if there was a change in the composition and a change in the ability of who migrated, we would expect to see that more highly able individuals were migrated as a response to these higher costs and that they would do better in the U.S. in terms of their wages and that these Mexican immigrants would do better in the U.S. compared to other Latin American uh, immigrants. And the last one actually breaks it down by uh, education and age groups. Okay. Um, so now we're looking at, it, similar to what we saw before, do we notice any difference um, by uh, education uh, as well um, um, as age? So <coughs> we're interested to see, do we see some of the same trends that we've observed um, in the previous um, uh, results here? Um, so again, we can look at um, uh, in terms of low education versus high education among highly educated uh, um, uh, immigrants. Those in Mexico, uh, highly educated uh, immigrants from Mexico, women earn more than men. Um, but that's also the same among Latin uh, American immigrants, but that the results are bigger for those uh, um, immigrants from Mexico um, compared to those from Latin America. Um, when we compare younger and older immigrants, though, um, the results aren't statistically significant there. We see, again, that among older immigrants, um, uh, women in Mexico uh, earn, or uh, women immigrants from Mexico earn more relative to men, um, but so do Latin American immigrants, and even though uh, the earnings uh, is greater for Mexican women than for immigrants from other Latin American countries there, um, the results aren't statistically um, significant. Okay, so just to kind of summarize, um, the cost
cost of undocumented migration we know has uh, increased. Um, we're hypothesizing that the costs are greater for women than for men. How do we go about testing this? Well, we can't do it directly, which is why we had our theoretical framework try to just look at did the composition, the compositional uh, of immigrants change as a result of these higher uh, border costs. Uh, we see some evidence that supports um, that, again, when we break down the immigrant population by age uh, and schooling categories, um, and particularly when we look at wages and see that the outcomes for women are better than for men, uh, and the outcomes for older uh, uh, women are better than they are for younger women, um, there is some evidence to support that perhaps the compositional change did, uh, uh, the, the composition of the immigrant population did change as a result of these higher migration um, costs. Another thing to think about, you know, um, is that, again, cost matters. So, well, this is sort of, you know, our preliminary work into this uh, area of cost and migration. Um, this idea that costs are constant across all groups, uh, by either uh, education level or by gender, we can see that there is evidence to suggest we should really, that's not the case. That costs do differ um, based on schooling, and that costs can uh, vary greatly uh, based on gender. So trying to incorporate more of this cost into our selection models, um, if we're really trying to detect, you know, who's migrating? Are these less skilled workers? Are these medium skilled workers? Are these high skilled <coughs> workers? Um, up to now, the theory that's been dominant has been the negative selection theory, that all the migrants from Mexico are negatively selected. They're all low-skilled immigrants. Well, that might not necessarily be the case if we start to assume that costs can vary across groups. Also, there's a lot of policy that tries to um, address the selection of immigrants, trying to keep out undocumented immigrants, but George Borjas advocates for policies that would actually encourage positive selection. So encourage the migration of more highly educated workers because they have a lower fiscal uh, 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 burden uh, on states. So this idea that, okay, do we want to only admit certain types of immigrant workers? Well, you know, we don't have to raise the cost of crossing the border. We don't have to, you know, make it more e or difficult so that people are dying and getting raped on the border uh, in order to actually increase the selection of immigrants, to make it so that, look, the cost is so high the only people that are going to risk crossing the border are those with, let's say, a high ability or high level of uh, um, uh, natural ability. Well, there are other ways to do that rather than risk people dying at the border. Um, so there's sort of one policy implication. Oh, and that's it. <laughs>
I would wouldn't you think that the undocumented immigrants are really largely Mexican, so the other people who are, un, you know, don't have legal status in this country have overstayed their visas. They came legally originally, which is a different way of coming, except for some of the Central Americans, the Guatemalans and the Salvadorans. But most of the Mexicans are coming across the land border, so that cost, that gets visited on people crossing the land border. You're right, even, even maybe seeing differences in sort of, you know, I mean, there's not direct evidence, but there have been studies that kind of show which groups are more likely to overstay visas versus which groups are more likely to, you know, cross the border. So that might be something, like that to strengthen the argument. And aren't the Latin Americans and Caribbeans probably more educated on average than the yeah. Mexicans? So they're doing yeah. different jobs, too. But she controls her location. Yeah, but in, in some of those you know, graphs or what proportion have and how, who responds and that kind of thing? Well, I don't think they're No, but I think we need to look at, look at that Latin American population and see and make a better case for, you know, if we're going to say they're not going to be affected, then let's, let's take out the ones that would be and, and sort of really make a bigger difference between, between the Mexicans and the Latin Americans. Yeah? What were your sample sizes on the five-year restricted It's not easy to include. I've been sitting over here with a stupid optimal control problem. I can't figure it out. <laughs> well, you get a lot of things going on with that. I mean, you get people who will get their sister to replace them for three months while they go home. And you also get the fact that women don't get a lot of the labor market for experience. Mm -hmm. So it's, like it's a complicated thing to figure out. Maybe too complicated, but we can't figure out anything. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, then. Last chance. Sorry. Um, Please. Did you look specifically, when you were looking at years of education, did you look at years of education in the source country versus like education that may have been acquired shortly after immigration? No, what we tried to do is um, we only looked at uh, immigrants that were old, 16 years or older when they applied. 
migrated. So we were trying to get immigrants that um, where most of their schooling was kind of done already. But we didn't look, you're right, we didn't, of the ones that were in our sample, we didn't distinguish between sort of those that might have had a larger amount of their schooling done in one, one country or another. So that might be something. As far as the transferability mm -hmm. capital. Right, right. That's a good point. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank